hormones, health, and harmony. It has to be harmonized. It has to be a beautiful symphony because I say if one player in the symphony is out of tune, the whole sound is off. And so if insulin is off, it's going to pull on your thyroid because it creates the thyroid binding globulin. And if insulin is off, it's going to pull on your testosterone. If your testosterone is off, it's going to pull on your estrogen. If your estrogen is off, it's going to pull on your progesterone. So it becomes this little pulling of strings. And before you know it, this tapestry that was beautiful, that was your hormonal health is unwrapped before your eyes, truly. Welcome to the Woman's Doctor Podcast, helping empower women to embrace their body and soul's full potential. I'm your host, Dr. Trevor Cates, and after 22 years of working with patients, I found the answers to our health struggles are much deeper than most people realize. To help explore this, I'm interviewing colleagues and other wellness experts to get to the root cause so women can realize their true beauty and be informed decision makers for themselves and their loved ones. Aging is a curious thing. Humans start to age as soon as they reach adulthood, about 25 years old. According to a study published in 2021, the biological hard limit on our age, if we take out disease and disaster, is as high as 150 years. So if we're going to live to 150, we want to do so gracefully. And that's why I asked my guest today, Terry Cochran, to talk about this. Terry is the founder of the Global Sustainable Health Institute and an international thought leader in longevity. Through her decades of clinical work, Terry has developed the Cochran Method, a multi-system health and longevity model. She is the author of the Amazon best-selling book, The Wildatarian Diet, Living as Nature Intended. In today's interview, she shares with us how to eat to your genetic blueprint and how this helps with hormonal balance and longevity so we can look and feel our best to 150. She also shares what she personally does. And when she shares her age, I think it'll surprise you. And hopefully this inspires you too. Welcome, Terry. It's great to have you on the Woman's Doctor podcast. Welcome. Thank you. It's so good to see you again. Yes, it's great to see you too. And I wanted to have you on because we are talking constantly about living longer. There's this trend right now, people are living longer, which is amazing. But if we're living longer, we want our quality of life to be fantastic too. And as women, there's certain things that we want to take into consideration. And I know that you know quite a bit about this. So I wanted to have you on to chat with me about this. Oh, I'm so happy to be talking about this because longevity has of late really caught fire, if you will. Uh, there are so many players in the field of longevity. How do we live to be 140? How do we optimize those 140 years? What does it mean to live at this number that you, we could have never imagined? You know, if you look to the Bible, there were some that lived 900 years. Well, was that a fable or was that true? Right? So... <clears throat> As we look at time and as we look at our cellular expression through the passing of time, it's really important to, especially for women, to not buy into what you will be and look like at a certain age, what you will be and look like at 40, at 50, at 60 and beyond, and really redefining what it means to be in your personal power, living in a body that really is giving you back the right signals of mental acuity, of muscle mass, of collagen structure, of hormone balance, of insulin sensitivity, of happy thoughts, of good sleep, you know, a heart that's, that's a happy heart. Uh, they say that the heart is really the seat of the soul in terms of knowledge and wisdom and that more, more is communicated from the heart to the uh, head than the head to the heart. So looking at all those angles uh, of what it means to be a woman as we kind of clock down the years. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's start with food, talking about food and how that plays a role in, in longevity. A, I believe it is central to longevity. So the work of nutrigenomics, which is how genes are expressed through our food choices, 
is really paramount. It's paramount in my work and in the work that we do here in our clinic and outside the DC area. We say you eat to your genetic blueprint and your current state of health. And so for women in particular, that cycle every month, especially if you're still in the in the pure time in your life where you're, you're mensing, that it is critical that we tie the foods to our cycles. And for example, and our genetic blueprint. So a woman like myself that has the MTHFR C677T gene expression, what does that mean? Well, I have a methylation gene. Well, what does that mean? It means that I recycle estrogen. It means that I don't break down fats as easily as some other people. It means that I don't break down my protein without some support. So when I was mensing and when I was trying to have children, that was before genetics were involved. Well, I had multiple miscarriages. I had to be on bed rest for 10 weeks with each of my kids. Why? Because I had low progesterone relative to my estrogen because I was recycling my estrogen and I was eating fatty, healthy foods. But during my cycle, that fat was even pushing my estrogen further, pulling back my liver. I see this so much with other women in my practice. And so really tying their genetics to their cycle during their, that 28 to 30 day period is integral and really, really important to how we feel, how we're processing our hormones. That includes our thyroid hormones, our insulin hormones, how we think, because if we're estrogen dominant and we're pushing, oh, let's have that soy milk because I can't have cow milk. That's not good if you're eating estrogen or even those really healthy chia seeds, chia are high in estrogen and chia has become very popular. And so if I'm pushing that estrogen, especially around my period, estrogen competes for serotonin. So now I get depressed. Well, maybe we're depressed because we're eating a bunch of chia seeds and flax seeds and foods that can be estrogenic. And so we're putting on an, put on an antidepressant. All we needed to do was get lower on our fat and push that estrogen out and metabolize it. So really, really simple things can have a huge impact on our metabolic health and our, and our mental acuity. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's so true. And I, I think food is so crucial for our, um, you know, genetic expression and how things, you know, play out with our longevity and the diseases that we are predisposed to because of our genetics and how that'll show up and how you might have something that runs in your family, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have it because of, um, of way we can turn um, genes off and on. Absolutely. And to longevity, you know, that Dr. David Sinclair out of Harvard, who's a geneticist, really speaks to one of the biggest uh, de derailers of longevity is insulin insensitivity. That means if we're not metabolizing our insulin appropriately, it is a, such an inflammatory marker. Actually, Alzheimer's has been called uh, type three diabetes, right? So, and, and so for women in particular, because we are so tied to insulin for our other hormones, for our estrogen, our progesterone, our testosterone, is that insulin can be a really big problem. And what's so misinformed out there in the world is that sometimes your insulin is not about the sugar and fruits that you're eating. They may be actually helpful because they're breaking down fats. Maybe you have a fat metabolism issue or you have an amino acid utilization issue, meaning you're not breaking down your proteins. So by not breaking down your proteins, you're becoming insulin insensitive. And so it's really, really important to understand that. And I can't really stress enough what a big player insulin is, is in longevity, but in specifically in women's health. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think when we talk about hormonal balance, a lot of times people think about especially women, estrogen, progesterone, right? Uh, but insulin is a really important hormone and it balances our, our blood sugar. It has the ability to, if, we, if it's, if insulin levels are correct and our pancreas is making the right levels and, uh, and the right amounts. And so we don't, well, a lot of times people forget that we have all these different hormones besides just estrogen and progesterone, but they all play a role together. And there's just such an important symphony of hormones. And I know you're in my docu-series, Hormones, Health, and Harmony. Super excited to share your message in that. But that was part of the what we, we talk about a lot in the docu-series. Absolutely. I mean, hormones, health, and harmony, it has to be harmonized. It has to be a beautiful symphony because I say if one player in the symphony is out of tune, the whole sound is off. And so if insulin is off, it's going to pull on your 
thyroid because it creates the thyroid binding globulin. If insulin is off, it's going to pull on your testosterone. If your testosterone is off, it's going to pull on your estrogen. If your estrogen is off, it's going to pull on your progesterone. So it becomes this little, this little like pulling of strings. And you, before you know it, this tapestry that was beautiful, that was your hormonal health is unraveled before your eyes truly. Yeah. So what are some other things that you have found to be particularly helpful in balancing hormones as we get older? So what we have to really look at is our liver. We really have to love our liver because our liver is one of our largest detoxifying organs. And part of liver is managing insulin. It's managing how we circulate estrogen. It's managing how we break down fats, the liver and the gallbladder, right? So the liver makes bile. What is bile? It's an emulsifier of fats. If our liver is backed up, we're not going to break down that fat. If our fat is not broken down, we're not going to be able to use that thyroid hormone that we may have to take because we have subclinical thyroid. We're not going to be able to use that bioidentical estrogen or progesterone that we've been given because we're in menopause. So detox is so important. And so it's not just about detoxing for detoxing sake, it's detoxing to your genetic blueprint and your current state of health. So for example, turmeric has been touted as a really just across the board, wonderful antioxidant. Well, if you have a certain gene, like I do, turmeric actually retoxes me. So trying to take turmeric tea as a detoxifier can actually super backfire. We had a woman that came into our practice and she said, Terry, I don't know what's going on. She was a new client. I've gained 15 pounds over three weeks and nothing has changed. What has happened? And she was not just weight, her, her lymphatic system, she was fluffy, like super fluffy. And when we really dissected her, what really had changed, she was started drinking five cups of turmeric tea a day because she was told it was good for her liver. So really understanding what are my true detoxifiers? What does my liver love? So detoxification is huge. Another thing is our stress response. Stress trumps everything, Trevor. Yeah. And stress, I call the dirty cupcake because it's a fat and a sugar. And it is a fat that's going to dislodge our insulin. When we get stressed, it's like eating a dirty cupcake. What does the body do? It responds by pushing insulin. If we're not using that insulin, we're going to wear it. So then we have that middle belly fat, right? Because insulin is called the fat storage hormone. If it's not used, it's stored as fat. So we've got to look at that stress response. And I say the stress is we start with the Cochrane method. We start with calm the body first before you do anything else, because if you're not, you're going to be really working upstream to manage hormone balance, insulin balance, mental acuity, weight, and longevity. Okay. All right. Well, Terry, I know how old you are and I don't know <laughs> if you want to share how old you are, but when you told me you were getting ready to celebrate your birthday and, and how old you were turning, I was like, what, what, is, so what you're talking about, you must be doing it. Um, I don't know if you're willing to share your age and what you personally do, but I can tell you whatever you're doing is working. <laughs> I love my age because again, age is just a reflection of what I feel it to be. So I turned 60 in January and I'm very proud of that because I honestly feel Trevor that I feel and look younger now than I did 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, I was starting this work, but I didn't have the, the benefit of developing my method fully, the, develop, the development of the epigenetic model that we have um, really developed that's so critical to understanding my genes. Because when I looked at my genes and I look at my family tree, my dad's side of the family, if you were in your late fifties, you were saying, I have about five years to live because they either died in their late, late fifties or early sixties. They didn't make it past that. My dad died at 67 and he was one of the later ones to pass. Uh, and so if you look at my genes, I should be kind of looking at, okay, uh, time to retire now. Cause I gotta go, I got a few years to live, but I am, I'm really outsmarting my genes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not allowing them to be expressed the way they could otherwise be. Otherwise I'd be arthritic with um, diabetes and heart disease that all was on my, my dad's side of the family. So to answer, what do I do? Well, I'm really careful in a way that is so happy and abundant for me. When I say careful is that I'm full of care for myself. So people think that being careful means it's truly like limiting. No, I care for myself and how do I do that? 
Well, I drink a green juice every morning that meets my genetic blueprint because if I were to do a kale juice, it would kick my butt. Instead, I do cilantro and cucumber. I eat wild. I cannot process proteins because I have that MTHFR gene expression. And all of my life, Trevor, I had digestive issues. I didn't know why, because I had protein and sulfur issues and oxalate issues. And I was trying to eat healthfully and eat chicken and eat broccoli and eat spinach. And it was, it was really destroying my, my, the integrity of my digestive tract. So eating to that blueprint and current state of health is super important. But I think the most important thing that I've done over these years is that I have changed the way that I react to my external environment. And through personal history of having some, what I call really crunchy times <laughs> in my personal past, it really taught me that when I was unskilled and how I responded, I got really sick. And so I had a choice of still responding to what was going on around me the same way and stay sick or, or changing the way I responded. And so the thought creates the thing which affects the genetic expression. And so I strive to live in a way that is pragmatic, but in a way that what if it could be easy? I'm striving to be in my personal power, not my my circumstantial power. I will not give my power away or my alignment away to an external circumstance. I have to be, I have to be thoughtful. I have to be uh, potentially pragmatic and I have to be prepared, but I'm not going to give it, give my power away, be afraid. Fear really paralyzes so many systems in our body. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think fear is something that we've all felt a lot of over the last couple of years. And so let's talk more about that. How do we handle fear as, as we experience it? Because fear is normal, right? Fear is something that we are all going to experience. We're going to continue to experience hopefully less. <laughs> Maybe we have, but what do we do with that? So uh, absolutely. As you said, fear is normal. We are made to understand fear so our bodies can get us out of trouble. And that's that fight or flight. And that's why if we have to run out of the way of a car or we have to be, if we're in a car and we say, oh my gosh, there's something coming down my way. I'm going to have the adrenaline, the epinephrine that I need to push my muscles to move quickly in real time and get out of the way of something that is harmful to me. However, the slow drip fear, that slow drip of I'm constantly in a state of fear and I don't even know I'm in a state of fear because that's the way my body has been programmed. So over time, we are literally superhuman computers and we develop patterns. What are, what are computers based on? They're based on patterns. Well, we live on patterns. And as we become accustomed to anything, we develop an internal pattern. And that internal pattern then becomes subconscious. And so we don't even know we're living in a state of fear. So what do we need to do? We need to check in with our bodies. Oh my gosh, I forgot that I could actually listen to my body. Am I feeling like really expansive and my heart feels really good right now? Or am I feeling, oh gosh, oh, I feel, I'm, am I tight? Did, is, is, are my muscles tight? Can I feel my hands being tight? Can I feel my, my quads? You know, I'm tight in my shoulders. Do I have my shoulders rolled back or are they up here? So really understanding where the body is and then interrupting that signal, which has now become subconscious is extremely powerful. Just because by thought alone, we can say, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that I had programmed myself to be in the state of tightness, uh, uh, fear, if you will. Now, the, the fear that we're experiencing in our world, that's, that's a, we're, we're in a state of, for the last couple of years, instability, uncertainty, just when we think we can exhale, something else comes. And so we don't want to put our, Put it, bury our heads in the sand. We can't run from what we have to face, but it's how we face it that makes the difference in how we're going to make decisions because they've done studies that when we make decisions from a place of fear, we can lose up to 50 points of IQ. So if I make a decision in a, in a place of fear, I'm not going to be making my best decision. So even if you just take a moment and, and, and interrupt your broadcast and center yourself and say, okay, I, I have to make a decision here. What can I do to bring in information? What can I do to help ally myself and 
I say there's power in the pause. Sometimes we think we have to make decisions or act in immediacy. Only if we're really running from a bear or trying to get out of harm's way, then yes. But we're too quick to move into things when we really have time. And that time gives us space and that space gives us consideration. And so that's a really big element of how to manage fear in these, in these times. Yeah. Thank you. Now, another thing that I know that you do that I think is so important is finding a great community, finding people that, I mean, talk about fear. If you're in, you know, if you hang out with other people that are constantly in a fear mindset, instead of a like, questioning like, Hey, is this really necessary? Do we need, you know, like what is, what is real fear here? What, what's true fear, you know, and having a, a community that helps support you and that you feel uplifted by, right? I believe that that is crucial to longevity and to any experience we're having. As a matter of fact, when you look, look at the blue zones on the planet, those are the zones, uh, places on, on the earth where people live the longest. The central theme across the world was community. Because we exist to complete a circuit. We are these little circuits looking to complete another circuit. And if you're completing a circuit with a community of fear, that's what you're gonna live and that's what you're gonna breathe and eat. And as we, before we went on air, uh, Trevor, you and I were talking about this beautiful community that we share. And specifically, as you brought us together to film the docu-series, what a beautiful community of brilliant women coming from naturopathy, from yoga, from energy, from all walks, even you know, actual doctors, MDs and NDs. But we were in community. And part, I believe, of why I know this, this docuseries is going to be so eminently successful is that you created an environment and a community for us to film that weekend that lifted our message, our individual message. And as the individual message was lifted, the entire message was lifted. And that's the power of community in a community of one that's collaborative, that's curious, that is co-elevating, not, oh, if she says this, I can't say that. No, we elevated each other. And that is incredibly powerful. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. and. Um... Yeah, I know I wanted to do that for every single time we interviewed people, but if for you know, it's like I couldn't, I could only do one event, but at least we got it to kickstart the whole, all the interviews for the docu series, and it was fantastic having you there. And what, uh, what a powerful group of women to come together. So thank you for for pointing that out. And um, I know that wasn't one of the questions that you like said, "Hey, Trevor, make sure you ask me this." <laughs> so that was just that was great. Well, Cherry, this has been so helpful. Will you please tell everyone where they can learn more about you and what you have coming up? What's going on? Oh, I would love to. So where you can learn more about me, I've written a book called The Wildetarian Diet, Living as Nature Intended. And you can find that on Amazon. And that is really about getting back to living as nature intended, because that's where we need to be. And it also speaks about eating to your genetic blueprint and your current state of health. TerryCochran.com, that is where you can find us if you want to see us clinically. Uh, we have, I've developed a supplement line that I'm very proud of because it's my specific formulations and you can get that on our website, all sorts of, uh, we're, we're informing all the time. We're on all parts of social media and what I have coming up, which is really, I'm really proud of is that in June, I will be speaking in Paris at the women in uh, tech summit, uh, in front of 30 countries and, and the, I'll be, I'll be moderating and leading a panel and it's to food systems on fire. And we're talking about how back to food, you know, food influences, not only our metabolic health, but it influences our economic health. It influences climate. It influences our national security because most of the, more than 50% of those eligible for military right now don't meet the minimum criteria because of obesity and mental health. So our food systems are on fire. So I'm really excited. I'm really proud to be uh, part of that. Another thing is the Cochrane method. We're hoping to bring it to, uh, <laughs> to a theater coming near you where we can actually train um, doctors and other uh, healthcare practitioners, hoping, hoping to release it 
probably at the end of 2022, maybe in the beginning of 2023. So I'm very excited about both of those things that are, that are kind of in the wings. Amazing. I know you're always up to amazing things. So again, thank you, Terry, for coming on today. Oh, so great to have uh, had the opportunity to speak together again. Thank you for listening to the Woman's Doctor podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to share it with the women in your life. And to learn all about balancing hormones, join us for the Hormones, Health, and Harmony docuseries at thewomansdoctor.com.